Let's put that on. Try to get on the right side since we turn the handle off. My mom to us said, <laughs> Hello? Hello? Okay, yeah, just that's good. Testing, testing. Welcome back, everybody. So, hope we had a good, fulfilling lunch. Hope the caloric intake will get you through the rest of the day here. So we're on for the uh, second half of our talks. So, and first up, uh, we have Nick Andrusky from Cal Poly over in San Luis Obispo. Um, he will be talking about ion cyclotron waves in the solar wind. And we're a little, we're, we're, we're getting about to one o'clock, so. Um, yeah, let's wait about like 30 seconds so we don't get too far off schedule. <laughs> Ooh, don't, <laughs> don't want to start too early. But yeah, we'll, we'll give you an extra minute to have a running start here. So. All right. Whenever you're ready, take it away, Nick. Okay. Um, as Chad said, I'm Nick Androsky, and um, I can't wait to tell you all about the research that I did this summer on um, electron, electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves uh, and the activity in the sub alphanic region of the sun. I did this work with the help of Dr. Christoph Paulson and Dr. Michael Stevens. Um, and yeah, let's get into it. Um, okay, so first let's get, cover a little bit of background about the sun and why we care about waves in the first place. Well, first off, I want to express to you that the corona is a lot hotter than scientists might have initially expected in the first place. So at the photosphere, the surface of the sun, we have a cool 6,000 degree Kelvin temperature. But as we move farther and farther up into the upper atmosphere of the sun, uh, the corona, um, these temperatures reach a alarming 1 million degrees Kelvin. And that's a big problem um, because we don't really know where the, what kind of mechanisms are providing the heating that can bring, up, um, bring the corona up to these high temperatures. Um, but um, theories have, uh, as of up until recently, theories have only um, been able to tell us um, what possible mechanisms might be present here. But um, this has all this has recently changed with the NASA's Parker Solar Probe mission that was launched in 2018, which is depicted here on the left. Um, and um, as that video that you just saw was the Parker Solar Probe um, um, animation going through its orbit. Um, and it is, this mission is the first time that we've been able to get in situ measurements of the corona um, that's, uh, and, and past the something called the Alphine surface that's allowing us to actually put these um, predictions to the test. But um, a theory has indicated that one possible explanation uh, for the heating that we're seeing in the corona is something uh, from something called wave particle interactions. And so through resonant conditions and plasma instabilities, we can get wave growth and wave, um, wave damping that can transfer energy between waves and particles and um, transfer energy over large scales without the need for any collisions. But the question is, what kind of resonance are we in interested in and what kind of waves are we interested in? Well, the short answer is that there are a lot of options. There are so many different types of wave modes that are out there in the complex dynamics of, the, of, of plasmas, and there are so many different resonance and instabilities that can occur with these waves. Um, it's so many of them, like, oh my gosh. Um, um, but thankfully, um, the, over the decades of work that's been done in this problem, um, one CERN wave um, type of wave mode has shown promise uh, as, a, a, as an energy source that could transfer um, um, energy to particles through an ion cyclotron interaction. Um, and this is, the wave mode is called the electromagnetic ion cyclotron um, wave. And I'll, I'll call it ion cyclotron waves for short from here on. Um, but some properties about these waves is that they occur at low frequencies around something called the ion cyclotron frequency, which describes the frequency that ions are gyrating about magnetic field lines as they move through the field of, um, the magnetic field of the sun. Um, and the, um, the waves also propagate around something called the Alphine speed, which is characterized by the magnetic field strength of the plasma and the particle density of that plasma. Um, some other properties are that they're left-hand circular polarized, but, um, and they have other uh, important key um, properties that are listed here. 
But um, these ion cyclotron waves uh, have, have been observed in previous data by um, instruments here uh, around Earth, um, uh, and they've been observed to contribute to acceleration of the solar wind. Um, and so there's curiosity behind whether the, um, these ion cyclotron waves could, uh, uh, that whether they're, they're present in the corona and the significance um, uh, that their presence would have on heating um, uh, of, this, uh, of the corona, um, trying to answer that heating problem. Um, but the, that, that brings us to the question of, um, while we've observed um, the um, ion cyclotron waves heating solar wind, where do we make the distinction between what's what is solar wind plasma and what is coronal plasma? So the answer is that this boundary is defined by the Alphine surface. And the Alphine surface distinguishes the corona from the solar wind plasma um, um, based on the, the idea that the, um, the corona, um, the upper atmosphere of the sun, is, um, is um, in causal connection with the sun, um, whereas the solar wind is not. And so what we mean as, by this is that one, once we pass the, this alphine surface, uh, we get into something called the subalphanic region. And the subalphanic region is where the speed of alphine waves, such as the ion cyclotron waves that we're interested in, are greater than the bulk radial flow of the plasma that's being um, flown outwards from the sun. And so when the speed of the, these waves are faster than that, that flow, then, it's able, then backward propagating waves are able to make it back towards the sun and we can get more of this um, dynamic and interactions from the waves. Um, and here on the left, we just have a simple model of, uh, of the Alphine surface. Um, it's indicated in the narrow red line. I mean, you see, we also see, an, um, and we're reading this from a meridional plane of the sun, so pole to pole. Um, and we see some interesting features around the middle um, where we have an incursion into the surface. And this is being caused by something called the heliosphere current sheet. And so what a current sheet is, a current sheet is a, a magnetic structure um, that's associated with a, a narrow band over which there is a magnetic field reversal. Um, and it drives a current across this field reversal. Um, and so once uh, the local magnetic field in this region um, diminishes greatly, and this causes a decrease in the magnetic pressure and subsequently an increase in the density to reach a new steady state that ultimately decreases the alphine speed in that region. And what this cause, causes in our observations is, is that it will cause a dip in the, um, or an incursion into the alphine surface um, as depicted on this left little a simple model. And so th these current sheets are also especially interesting because there's a lot of stream interactions that are happening here and unstable particle distributions that are primed to, um, to kick up wave activity, um, such as the, the, these interesting ion cyclotron waves. So we're especially interested in looking for what the wave activity is around these regions. Okay, that was the background, but um, we want to try and identify these subalphanic um, regions in the Parker Solar Probe data before we can start um, identifying the wave activity that we're interested in for coronal heating. Um, so to do that, um, I used something. Um, I used a ratio called the Alphine Mach number to define where the Parker Solar Probe crosses into the subalphanic region. And so the Alphine Mach number is just the ratio of the two parameters I discussed previously: the bulk radial flow of the plasma over the Alphine speed. And so when the Alphine speed is greater than the bulk radial flow, we're in the subalphanic region. This ratio is less than one. And so here I have plotted the, um, the Mach number um, during the um, perihelion, one of the perihelion encounters of Parker Solar Probe. Um, and we can see that this red line is um, a Mach number of one. And when we're crossing, when these measurements cross below that value, that's, uh, that's what we identify as a subalphanic interval. And we'll notice a very interesting effect uh, or uh, feature in this data is around the last two um, subalphanic intervals in gray is that we have a large spike or incursion um, that, that occurs. And so this is actually um, caused by um, an incursion from the current seat that we just discussed. And so I did this work um, identifying subalphanic intervals throughout the um, perihelion encounters of Parker Solar Probe, um, the eighth all the way up to the 15th perihelion encounters. And I've plotted their, the Mach number measured during those encounters um, across each of these, uh, across these encounters. Um, and so here's a plot of the Parker Solar Probe's orbit um, relative to the rotating sun um, and what it measured. And we can see that it consistently when the, the Parker Solar Probe gets within 15 to 20 solar radii, that um, it's consistently measuring a um, Mach numbers below one in blue. Um, 
And, um, and we can also see that the simple model that I showed of the affine surface might not be the most accurate description of an affine surface. There's a lot more um, fluctuations and um, changes that can happen, um, and it's just not as simple as that model may have depicted. But okay, we have our subalphanic intervals. Now let's now we want to try and identify wave activity within those subalphanic intervals. How do we do that with magnetic field time series data? So to do this, what we do is we use some Fourier analysis to decompose uh, magnetic field measurements um, and break them into uh, frequency components. And so by applying this Fourier analysis, we can calculate many different wave parameters as a function of frequency. Um, and, and one of these wave parameters is something called coherency. And coherency is a very important parameter for us because we are um, coherency measures how in phase or coherent the fluctuations we are observing at each frequency. Um, and so a value of one is very coherent in phase activity, while a value near zero is more noisy, turbulent kind of fluctuations. And so um, what we can do is, um, while we have this plotted for um, um, over a short interval of time, we applied Fourier analysis and found the coherency, we want to know how this might change over time as well. And so we apply Fourier analysis over short time periods and build them up um, to get um, a whole uh, range of the, this coherency parameter measured as a function of frequency and measured uh, as a function of time. And so this allows us to try and identify where we're observing coherent fluctuations. Now we can put, we can calculate this for lots of different other wave parameters and throw them all together into a big mess. Um, and, um, and this is what I was looking through um, so many uh, different pictures and plots of these to try and find some interesting um, wave activity. So let's just go through um, how, what kind of wave activity is interesting. So if you look at the coherency plot that I just discussed, what we're looking for is um, the very coherent um, in phase activity. And so we can see that around one UT and around 230 UT at, at around uh, the frequencies of, of four, to five, uh, four to six Hertz. Um, we do see a, a large um, coherent um, a narrow band across the whole region, but that's just an instrumental effect due to the reaction wheels on Parker Solar Probe. Um, but um, so we identified some wave activity. If we move up to the plot of ellipticity, which indicates the polarization state of the of these um, of the fluctuations, um, we see that the, that we have um, that these fluctuations have um, an ellipticity of negative one, and this is indicating um, a left-handed circular polarization, which is what we expect from ion cyclotron waves. Um, and if we move up further, we see a plot of the wave power, which indicates the strength of these, or the amplitude of these fluctuations at each frequency. And we see that, compared to the background, that these, um, that these fluctuations, these coherent fluctuations, have a relatively high wave power. Um, and the pointing flux uh, is telling us a similar um, um, information. It's indicating the amount of electromagnetic energy flux at each of these frequencies. It is also showing that there's high um, uh, flux at, those, at these bands. And finally, we have a plot of the wave normal angle, which, gives, uh, which is the angle between the propagation of those fluctuations and the background magnetic field. And so it's telling us that these, alphine, uh, that these, um, these waves that we're observing are um, propagating very closely aligned with the magnetic field, um, which is also something that we expect with the ion cyclotron waves. Okay, so I used this analysis and looking at several different plots and trying to find some patterns and interesting activity. And what I found is that there was a pattern of, um, of wave activity that was characterized by two discrete frequency bands that would neighbor sites of incursions of the alphine surface. So this is the plot that I just showed um, earlier. And what, we ha what I have different here is that I've overplotted in blue um, the cyclotron frequencies um, of the proton and helium ions. Um, and we can see um, at the, at the top, um, top right that we have um, that, um, if we see in the previous um, slide, we can see there's, there's two bands, um, two distinct bands that we can observe following um, this, this activity here. Um, and so, um, and it seems that the, the cyclotron frequencies are bounding these bands as well. Um, and, um, and so we want to look, uh, and, and if, if, and I should specify, how do we know that we're at a site of incursion or an alphine, uh, a, a site of incursion of the alphine surface? Well, if we take a look at the Mach number and magnetic field measurements during this um, time range, we see that right around, right in between these, um, these two um, instances of wave, co coherent wave activity, we see a large spike in the Mach number 
um, and uh, that's associated with a, a large um, decrease in the magnetic field magnitude and the radial component of the magnetic field as well. And when we combine this with empirical models that show the um, that give us the um, distance from the heliospheric um, current sheet, um, this in, this data indicates that Parker Solar Probe, while we don't see a full uh, magnetic field reversal, we have a close approach with a current sheet. And um, around this close approach of the current sheet is where we're seeing, the, seeing this coherent two-banded frequency um, activity. And so. The, the work that I'm starting to work on now is trying to characterize that activity. And so and one way that we can do that is look at the wave parameters averaged across the double banded activity that we're observing. And so here on the left is the pointing flux that's averaged across the, um, the double banded activity that I showed in the stack plot. Um, and we can see how the, um, the cyclotron frequencies um, um, separate uh, two distinct peaks of the pointing flux. Um, and on the right, we see the wave normal angle um, um, for, uh, for average across this interval as well. And we see two distinct minimums of, of, the, wave, um, uh, of the wave normal angle um, around 20-ish um, 20, uh, 20 degrees. And um, this is indicating that these two bands are, do seem to be like two distinct populations. And so um, we're interested in analyzing this further to, um, to see if this aligns with ion cyclotron theory and why, why we might expect two bands to exist here. Um, and we, I've also generated many distance statistics of the wave activity that we're observing during subalphanic waves, uh, during sub, uh, subalphanic intervals in general. And so here I have some plots of distance statistics. The top is dis, uh, statistics on the distance, um, the activity that we observe um, um, and where it's occurring relative, relative to the distance it's occurring relative to the sun. And the bottom is the distance um, of that activity, that, where that activity is occurring relative to the heliospheric current sheet. And so um, what we, um, uh, and one thing I'd like to note is um, we're normalizing these over um, the, the time of the um, subalphanic intervals. Um, and so um, uh, the, the data uh, around 20 to 25 um, solar radii and from um, zero um, and upwards uh, of uh, degrees of heliocentric, uh, heliospheric current sheet distance, um, those are low statistic data, and we should treat them less significantly um, because these low statistics might not be showing um, a, a large pattern. Um, but um, in general, the patterns that we see here is that um, um, as this um, nice little um, um, comment here notes, is that from this bottom plot, um, uh, we see that 70% of the time that's being spent at around negative 30 degrees away from the heliospheric um, current sheet, um, that, uh, that, that within these subalphanic intervals, that we're observing double banded activity. And we also see that um, around um, um, Twenty-five percent of the time, um, we're also observing double banded activity during um, um, very close, uh, right at the current sheet distances. Um, and so we're going to continue looking at this um, and trying to figure out um, other patterns um, and um, comparing that wave activity from during the current sheet crossings um, in subalphanic regions versus current sheet crossings that are happening in um, superalphanic regions to see if this is just a characteristic feature that we're observing in the subalphanic region or if this is just happening for all current sheets, um, currency crossings. Um, and so we'll, we'll be doing more work on trying to compare this to predictions of um, ion cyclotron theory and, um, and look at how, um, how the particle distributions um, in the plasma are being changed um, during the same time that we're observing this wave activity in the hopes that we can see if ion cyclotron waves might be having an impact on um, the, 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 the plasma in that region and if it could be a candidate for coronal heating. Um, thank you so much, and I'd like to um, thank um, my mentors, Christoph, for being a plotting wizard, um, and um, and all the interns here, and the sweet solar wind group that made it feel like a nice little community, and um, it, it's really helped um, make this summer great. So thank you so much. Excellent, Nick. Thank you. So we're going to go right into questions. Kathy. <laughs> Can you plot uh, the, the quantities that you've plotted there were either a, a function of time or a function of frequency? 
Mm -hmm. Have you looked at anything as a function of radius? Of the sun? Of radius from the sun. Um, yeah. Well, um, one one plot we're 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 think these are these are plotted with the, the wave activity that we're observing. Um, this top one um, based off the the distance that we're observing that activity from the sun, um, and we're mostly observing this activity um, um, when Parker's solar probe is closest to its perihelion, um, and that's where we're seeing the double banded activity and um, activity around the sites of incursion. Um, so um, and um, in the future, uh, we're planning on trying to make a, make a, a plots of um, against um, helio, um, the the distance from the sun and the distance from the current sheet, and seeing if there's any relationships between those, um, and um, if pointing flux and the weight different wave parameters change um, depending on that. So, All right, Sam. So in about two months' time, you'll have data that is on the left-hand edge of your plot here, down to 11.4 RS. Do you have any predictions for what you might see there? Um, that's, that'll be really interesting um, because it does... Um, a lot of the... the, um, the I have something. Um, a lot of the subalphanic intervals that we've been... Run, that Parker Solar Probe has been encountering through seem to be large protrusions of the surface that are coming out really far up from the sun. And so as we're getting closer and closer to the, to the sun um, with this next encounter, um, we're, we're going to be starting to get more consistently in the subalphanic region and get more time of um, observing um, um, what potential wave activity might be occurring there. Um, and um, and, and I, I'm hoping that we'll get um, Usually there's only about, we usually only pass the, the current sheet about um, once uh, when we're um, going through perihelion. And once, uh, we only get like one kind of statistic um, during perihelion of a subalphanic current sheet crossing. And so I'm hoping that we are going to see potentially more of those um, and, um, 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 and, and seeing if these double banded activity becomes more prominent or not. So it's hard to say what predictions I have because it's, I'm still very, very new to all this, and plasma wave theory is, is very complicated. So, um, but um, I, I'm definitely excited to keep adding more and more data that's closer to the sun. So that's all the time we have for questions for this talk. So once again, let's give a round of applause for Nick. All right, up next, we have Celeste de Salte Flores, so coming from New Mexico Tech, once again. So, and um, she is gonna talk about infrared spectro spectroscopy, um, or airborne infrared spectroscopy, I could say, and a lot of the instrumentation that goes into that. So, thank you. Okay, so, is this on? Or do I have to wait for a second? Or is it on? Oh, really? It's on. Oh, I can hear it, okay. All right, so hello. My name is Celeste Lizalde Flores. I've been working with Jenna Samra and Vanessa Marquez this summer to um, understand the importance of resolution and durability in cryogenic coronal spectrometers. Now, that title is kind of long, so. Oh, I just, oh okay, oh, you can use the mouse. Okay, so I'm gonna break down a little bit of what I'm gonna talk about before I get into it. Um, I'm going to briefly mention why we studied the solar corona um, and talk about the methods and instruments we use to observe them. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about how and why these instruments need high resolution. And I'll go through a um, specific example with some of the science that I did with um, AirSpec. And then I'll move on to the design consideration for a cryo chamber of Corsair and how to keep it uh, still, durable, and functional when in use. 
So the solar corona, as we've been hearing, is quite mysterious. Um, there are a lot of interesting things that we can observe, such as solar flares and CMEs. Um, there are things such as solar wind that can uh, directly affect the Earth, um, but not drastically. And there's a lot of interesting things with the plasma and magnetic field relations. There are a lot of um, theories right now that really can predict what kind of um, how the behavior is between them, but there's no exact observations um, or a lot, a lot of observations that can really support this kind of science. Additionally, there is um, the coronal heating problem, which is essentially as you leave the photosphere and you get into the corona, it gets hotter, which is counterintuitive. And so there are different ways you can observe the solar corona, and sometimes the sun is in the way. So when you're in visible light and near infrared, um, there are opportunities in which uh, you can observe the solar corona through eclipses, and this is like a natural way of seeing it with the moon. Or you can create your own artificial moon in some cases, such as SOHO instrument that uses a, an occulter to observe the solar corona. There are also ground-based instruments that can make use of extreme ultraviolet violet, such as this image here. But um, today I'm gonna talk about more specifically airborne instrumentation, and where as we get higher into the atmosphere, we're um, able to avoid some of the atmospheric um, absorption, not entirely, but mostly. And although it's nice that that atmosphere is there to protect us, it's not nice for the science. <laughs> and so as, um, this brings me to the AirSpec instrument. It is an infrared ins uh, spectrometer that's been attached to the Gulfstream um, 5 jet. Um, and this instrument took two measurements in 2017 and 2019 during their uh, different solar eclipses. Um, in 2019, actually, it took one, of, uh, one measurement where it was past totality. And so there, and this gave us a glimpse of the transition region. And so I want to emphasize that this is a uh, plot from this specific measurement. Um, the atmospheric absorption was already subtracted here. This is an intensity versus pixel plot. And what's interesting here is uh, we can immediately recognize that there are helium hydrogen lines here. But what's really interesting is that there's also ionized sulfur silicon and iron lines, which are here. Now, these three in particular, they have been predicted to, um, and they know we know that they exist, but they have never actually been observed. So this is the first time that these have been recorded and we can actually find their wavelengths. So let's do that now. So if we zoom into one of the lines, this is a helium line. Um, we can fit a Gaussian curve and this will allow us to find this specific um, pixel location in the, where, of where the peak intensity is. Um, and we can do that to all of the helium and hydrogen lines and find their specific points. Using these points, we can then compare them to the known wavelengths from in this database, and we can create a conversion or some sort of conversion using a linear fit, such that we can take our pixels and convert it to wavelength directly. So going back to these lines, um, we can again uh, fit some Gaussian curves to them and find their exact uh, pixel location. And then we can convert these uh, wave back to wavelength or into wavelength, and here they are. Very interesting. This is, like I said again, these have never been recorded before. And of course, there's always um, associated errors with these. Um, and so when we have variants, we have these, uh, the B and M constants, which are associated with the linear fits and the pixel variable, which is associated with the, the associated error with the Gaussian fits. And this gives us errors of plus or minus 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 um, angstroms. And so I want to emphasize that these measurements are in angstroms, which is 10 to the minus 10 of a meter. And I emphasize this to get to my point that resolution is important. If the uh, spectrometer that was on AirSpec had any lower resolution, these um, results may have not have been so, so reliable. And it really um, shows the importance of why we really need to um, emphasize resolution when we build instrumentation. So moving on to our next instrument, um, Corsair is a coronal uh, spectrometer. Um, it's going to be launched in 2024 with a test flight and again in 2028 uh, with a longer observation time and in Antarctica. Here's a CAD model of the entire thing, or most of it, it's approximately four meters long. It'll be attached to a gondola, which will be attached to the balloon. <coughs> so uh, just a quick brief uh, overview of how this instrument works. If we take 
a solar measurement and imagine that we are taking light through the objective lens. It'll go through to this piece, which is the <coughs> occulter. It'll take any unwanted um, light out, literally out the window. <laughs> And then it'll, oh, this will give us the chronograph. Um, as we continue on, it'll go through the polarimeter, which will allow us to control um, which direction of the, like light we have, because light is polarizable. And this will allow us to see whether we see the line of sight uh, or um, plane of sky measurements. Um, very lastly, it'll go up to the spectrometer here, which will split the light in near infrared. And here we will add a cryogenic chamber to avoid the um, glowing effects of when observing objects in near infrared, as objects tend to glow in these wavelengths in warm temperatures. Okay, so what sort of effects happen when you add a cryogenic chamber to an instrument? Um, oh, this changed the order. Um, I'll get back to this slide actually. <coughs> so what sort of um, effects happen on the spectrometer? Um, so as you can imagine, uh, there's, this is not an ideal um, environment for an instrument. Uh, objects can brittle, they shrink, and they move, and this can directly affect the lens resolution and durability. And so if we look at the lens in particular, um, we can see here is an example um, of how this affects the a convex lens. We can imagine light incoming and it'll converge to a point. This point is known as the focal point. But when the lens shrinks and changes um, size, uh, the same way or the same light that can comes will uh, shift over, which um, is not always good because we want high resolution again. Um, and so to mitigate that, I did some ray tracing simulations um, with ZMAX software. And here is the three lens configuration in the program. The two outer lenses are stationary and the center lens is able to move along the Z axis. Um, and so here's what kind of what we're looking for in the simulation. Here we have uh, the spot diagrams for both of what we want and what happens when we change to a much colder temperature. Um, and these are, it, to change it from 1,000 to 40 uh, microns, we have to move that center lens by only one millimeter. And so this is a good thing because this is feasible with the current setup and that means that the cords, all of the, um, our people out in uh, CDP don't have to redesign the entire instrument. <laughs> and so um, another aspect that um, the cryogenic chamber affects is the, um, the objects that hold the lens themselves. So aside from the lens, you'll have nylon pads and an aluminum bezel. Um, and important, what's important to note here is that the lenses have already been procured, so we have to design around these specific dimensions. Um, so we have to design for the nylon and aluminum bezel, and we can find these using the linear thermal expansion equation, which relates um, how much a material contracts or expands and to the change in temperature, and that is scaled by a coefficient of thermal expansion, or the CTE. Um, and so basically, we can uh, use this equation to determine the, um, the dimensions for the aluminum and nylon pads when in warm temperatures, such that and they, when we assemble them in this configuration and change the temperature, they go back to their desired measurements. And of course, this is an exaggeration. It looks more like this, <laughs> just to get the point across. Okay, um, go back to... So how did I find these um, <laughs> dimensions? So it's a bit conceptual, but essentially what I did, um, I, I, what we wanted is to have the CTE of the aluminum to expand at the same rate of the nylon and the lens together. And so with some magic and equations, <laughs> uh, you can grab this equation, which uh, describes the line, nylon thickness from the, ni uh, the lens diameter and known CTEs of each material. Um, and so, to back up these exact measurements, I tried to do uh, thermal simulations in SOLIDWORKS, but it didn't quite work out when I first tried. Um, if you don't constrain it properly, there's some weird things going on with the materials going through each other and just really strange behaviors. So I consulted one of my mentors, thank you Vanessa, <laughs> and she helped me make this simulation, which looks more realistic. But of course, we have to always question how good is the simulation. Um, so. 
uh, of course, the material properties aren't always accurate. Um, and uh, in this case, I think I chose um, as close as possible to the materials that is going to be in the actual spectrometer. But of course, they weren't, they weren't the exact ones. Um, and are the constraints realistic? Um, for this model to work and not go through each other, I had to um, constrain all of the surfaces together. And in the actual instrument, these pieces are actually going to be a little more looser. They're not going to be bounded in any way. Um, and so, of course, we also have to question simulations in general. Of course, they're not, in reality, it's not always ideal. And so this brings us to the overall idea um, with uh, instrumentation. And so more often than not, it feels like we have some sort of science goal that we can be like, hey, we want to measure this. Let's just build an instrument and measure it, and I can get my Nobel Prize. <laughs> but it's not quite simple. There are so many things you have to consider. Um, even me, who had for the few, oh, I touched that. For the few moments, or not few moments, for the summer that I was here, I was only able to look at resolution and cryogenic effects, but this is a complicated instrument with many things to really consider. And so it actually just looks like a bounce back of what science goals can I achieve with what's realistic. And of course, I'd like to thank Jenna and Vanessa for allowing me to do both science and engineering this summer. Um, I've had a lot of fun. I've met incredible people. And thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Celeste. So do we have questions? Kathy has a question. Turning into Ed. OK. Um, so I, my question is about your spectrum from the beginning, where you were finding all the hydrogen lines and then figuring out the, the wavelengths of the, the silicon and iron lines. Yeah. So um, of course, if there's any sort of velocities along the line of sight, you can get Doppler shifts in these lines and the, yeah. the frequencies will move around. Yeah. Is that anything that you had to deal with in this particular case? No, and actually I had talked to Jeanette for like a good time in her office discussing whether we should consider these because um, yeah, the instrument was looking at a moving sun, but because I used a linear fit, um, and here, let me see if I can. So because we're comparing the pixel locations to the, this point and this point with the known wavelengths, we're not really um, plotting. Um, it's sort of like a comparison with uh, itself. So we know since this is the location of a helium, helium line and this is a hydrogen line, we can kind of interpolate of where the middle regions are. So we kind of don't need to really account for the moving or rotating sun. Yeah, this is also 2019, and during that eclipse, there was nothing happening on the sun. So <laughs> other than, you know, some rotation of the plasma due to looking at the limb. So. Any other questions? Yes, Christoph. Hi. Just with all your expansion modeling and trying to make sure that things are still head in, held in place, do you have to worry about stress and stuff on the mirrors? Is that something you have to account for at all? Is there like yeah. a and actually, limit you have to make sure it didn't snap? Mm -hmm. So here's like a good example kind of. So this is obviously a drawing, but say these nylon pieces were too big or adding stresses. Um, since when we have that cryogenic temperature change, um, the materials in there can become slightly more brittle. And so and if these materials shrink or if the aluminum bezel shrinks too quickly for the nylon or the lens, things start to crack. So it is something that you do have to consider. Um, but in the simulation, I think the effects were quite small, um, even though they're quite exaggerated in this simulation. <laughs> it's quite pulsy. It was, wigged me out a little. I thought it was an alien when I first saw it. <laughs> Yes, Chriselle. Excellent talk. So uh, how cold do you need to get? Do you know how cold you have to get it? Uh, and is there like a constraint on like how cold it can get or how fast? So uh, it's supposed to cool down to 150 Kelvin, but it should go no more than 70 Kelvin.
Mitch has a question. Thanks. Um, so with the uh, spectral lines that you identified wavelengths for, mm -hmm. um, you said that those had been predicted. And I was curious um, if you had any idea off the top of your head, um, like what temperatures these form at or any other characteristics? Yeah. So because the, so you can imagine the coronal, anything in the corona is very, very, very hot. Um, these are highly ionized, so the Xi is the number of ions that it had stripped off, and I believe that's Xi is 11, but it's like a weird notation, so it's actually just 10. <laughs> but yeah, these, they're, the, for these sort of ionized elements to exist, it has to be extremely hot. I don't know the exact I, I temperatures. Yeah. yeah. So the, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, so the the silicon six line that you see there, as you might expect, it's the coolest one, and I think it, in the log it's like five point six, so less than a million Kelvin. Um, so uh, I don't, I can't do that in my head. Um, the iron, the others are between a million and and two, or maybe one point five, just rough numbers. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Let's get a round of applause for Celeste. <laughs> All right, and with that, we're going to break a little bit early for our afternoon coffee break, although the coffee's probably not in a good state right now, so this will be more like a soda break. So we'll reconvene in about 20 minutes at 2 p.m. 2 p.m.
here or this side? <laughs> The black one. Oh, the oh, it's already up here. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I, I had to look at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she already gave it. Yeah, she's actually, I'm just going to set it off today. I know, it should be. I should third. I probably should be much more fluent the second time. Yeah, I'm going to read it. Yeah, I'm going to read it. All right. Welcome back, everybody. So from your quick coffee break, we are in the last round of talks here. We have three more to go. And right now we have Sophia Davis from the University of Michigan. She's going to talk to us about shockwaves in space. Um, oh, yes, everyone can hear me. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Sophia Davis, and I'm a solar REU student here this summer at the CFA. And I'm very excited to show you what I've been working on in these past couple weeks. I feel like I've slowly but surely maybe kind of fallen in love with the world of plasma and solar physics in the meantime. Um, working with Lucas Giuliano, Tatiana Hernandez, and Mike Stevens, my project is concerned with shockwaves in space. Can one satellite tell us what's coming or do we need a fleet? All right, so um, with that being said, I'm gonna give you guys a quick overview of what I'll be talking about today. My project is best divided into these four sections. So shock identification, single spacecraft analysis, multi-spacecraft analysis, and a comparison of those two methods in regards to shock characterization. I will walk you through how I go about identifying them, the inner workings of both analysis methods, and my results from such work. But before we do that, a bit of background is definitely necessary. So let's define some key phrases from my project title. First, uh, what is the fleet that I'm talking about here? The data for this project is obtained by four spacecrafts located at L1 uh, that you can see here. Uh, we have WIND, ACE, DISCOVER, and SOHO, and out of the four, WIND is the tried and true all reliable. It has the most robust capabilities out of all the spacecrafts, therefore we use it for our single spacecraft analysis, as well as being the reference spacecraft for our multi-spacecraft analysis. So. Shockwave in space, that is definitely the most fundamental thing here to understand. So we are going to dial it back a bit and begin by describing a shock event that you all may be a little more familiar with. Simply put though, a shockwave is a propagating disturbance that moves faster than the speed of sound of the medium in which the disturbance is traveling in. So let's consider a jet, for example. When the jet is traveling at a speed lower than the speed of sound, the pressure waves produced have time to move out of the way, essentially, allowing for the disturbance to travel unperturbed. When the jet is traveling right at the speed of sound, that's when we begin to witness the pressure wave fronts overlapping each other. But when the jet begins to travel faster than the speed of sound, the waves do not have enough time to move out of the way, causing all of these wave fronts to pile up, producing a shock wave. So we can build off on that idea in order to understand what a shock wave in space, or in this specific case, what an interplanetary shock is. So these begin from the sun as charged particles as a result of different solar phenomena. Um, for example, here is a coronagraph video of a CME that occurred of April of this year that actually produced one of the shocks that I analyzed over the summer. Okay. Uh. Why is it not going? There we go. Interestingly enough, though, unlike the shocks that you see produced off of jets, these types of shocks are collisionless. And I know that sounds super weird. How is a physical shock produced if there are not collisions involved? Well, this is a result of magnetosonic effects, meaning these collisionless shocks are a result of wave particle interactions and plasma instabilities. This means that particles transfer energy through electromagnetic, electromagnetic fields rather than directly bouncing into one another. And so the shock wave itself, or the discontinuity, forms when the speed of the shock changes from submagnetosonic to supermagnetosonic. But why do we even care? Why do we even care to study these in the first place? Shocks, shown here in black in the GIF, um, interact with Earth's magnetosphere, denoted in green. The effects of a shockwave hitting Earth vary depending on the magnitude or the strength of the shockwave, as well as the conditions presenting upstream. 
from the very pretty northern lights to potentially causing radio or electrical blackouts, it is important that we are able to characterize these shock waves as best as we can, which is the whole motivation for this project. Which analysis method works best? All right. So now that we have a bit of background, let's move on, how, let's move on to how we actually begin to identify these shocks. The CFA has a database uh, containing information on interplanetary shocks observed by the WIND spacecraft, dating all the way back to 1995. My first task was to update the database for the years of 2022 and 2023. So here we see the WIND data itself plotted. This is what I look at whenever I first begin to my, begin my shock identification. I'll mention again that shocks are essentially discontinuities in plasma parameters, but what does that look like in data actually? Discontinuities show up as these abrupt jumps in the plasma and magnetic parameters, and we are looking at solar wind speed, thermal speed, density, as well as the magnetic field strength. And so, whenever I first started this project at the beginning of the summer and first began identifying these shock candidates, I remember being so excited because I thought I found roughly 30 potential shocks for 2022. And um, not a single one of those was a shock, as you guys can see here. Um, so let's look through some examples of not shocks before I show you guys what a real candidate looks like. So this part of the project is done by eye. So let's see why this is not a shock just by looking at it. Um, the abrupt jump you see here is not abrupt enough as we would actually expect from a shock event. This one here doesn't work because yes, we are looking at a discontinuity, but that's not the type we're looking for. That's probably like a magnetic bucket or reconnection, but that's not my area, so don't quote me on that. Um, and this one doesn't work because of the bumpy and noisy data before and after the discontinuity, which affects the accuracy of the analysis that we perform later on, which I will explain later. Ah, but lo and behold, a good shock candidate. What makes this good though? So I want you guys to look at the smooth up and downstream parameters denoted respectively in blue and green, um, as well as the distinct crisp abrupt jump that we see in red. But just because I think it looks like a shock does not mean it is a shock. These events must obey certain physical laws in order to be classified as an actual shock, which brings us to our single spacecraft analysis. During this portion of my project, I took the shock candidates that I identified earlier, and I run them through an analysis to verify their shock wave status. So we use the rankine huguenot jump conditions uh, to verify these shock candidates. The RH jump conditions, um, simply put, are a set of equations that are derived from Maxwell's equations as well as uh, conservation laws. And so this analysis assumes 1D planarity, meaning the shock is traveling as a plane from the sun, and this is simply for mathematical simplification. Um, once this analysis has been done, we can check the parameters that the analysis outputs to see if this meets the conditions to actually be considered a shock. So, as you can see, the analysis spits out a bunch of information, and we are actually only seeing a fraction of it here. So let's just show the information that we're actually concerned about, though. And for this verification, we look to the magnetosonic Mach number. And what that exactly is, is the ratio of the solar wind speed to the magnetosonic speed, both measured by wind. And so the magnetosonic speed is going to differ depending on where you are in the plasma, as differences in things like pressure and density can affect this measurement. And this ratio is calculated for both the up and downstream. And so whenever we see a change in the Mach number going from greater than one to less than one across the uh, discontinuity boundary, we have a shock. So let's look at an example output for an upstream Mach number, as well as um, its downstream Mach number. Seeing that we went from greater than one to less than one, we have a shock. So um, now that we have verified its status as a shock event, uh, we can now look into the key shock parameters. So the re results that we are primarily concerned with here from this portion, of course, are the speed of the shock, as well as the compression ratio and theta B in. And now that we have successfully completed our single spacecraft analysis, we must now corroborate these shock events using the three other spacecrafts in reference to wind. 
For this phase, we will attempt to estimate the shock propagation vector geometrically rather than um, analytically like earlier to yield an independent estimate of the shock speed to compare to the single spacecraft measurement. And as I said, uh, we are performing a geometric analysis using the distances and the time of shock arrival relative uh, of each spacecraft relative to wind. And so with these inputs, we are able to obtain the shock velocity as well as the direction that the shock is traveling in. And so, as I said um, earlier, while the fleet is all located at L1, that doesn't mean they're all like right there on top of each other. They're still at these various positions, meaning they detect the shock, uh, the shock wave at different times. And so in order to find these time delays, I match the corresponding event observed by the other spacecrafts to the one we analyzed using the single spacecraft analysis with wind. So here in white, that's wind data um, that would be the exact same as what I looked at in the single spacecraft analysis. And each spacecraft is uh, shown in the bottom in their respective colors. So right here, we're looking at SOHO data. And as you can see, the discontinuities that you see with wind versus the discontinuities you see with SOHO, they're not lined up right now. And so I, line them up as such, as best as I can possibly can. And so we see a time delay of roughly eight minutes for SOHO. And what's interesting about these time delays when you're given the positions of the spacecraft is that it can tell us a little bit about uh, how the shock is coming in. So as you guys can see here, so the sun um, is gonna be, I, Okay, it's gonna be here, somewhere over here, and then the Earth is gonna be located at zero, zero. Um, so, as you guys can see, SOHO is closer to the sun than wind, yet, given the time delay that we had found earlier, um, SOHO uh, detected the shock right after wind did, or eight minutes after wind did. And so this actually implies to us that the shock plane that came from the sun is tilted significantly from the sun-Earth line. So, now that we have obtained these two separate shock speeds using two separate analysis methods, it is now time to compare our results. How well did the two methods agree? Would a single spacecraft suffice, or do we actually need the fleet to properly characterize these shocks coming into Earth? At the beginning of the summer, I hypothesized that we would see absolutely no correlation between these two methods, and I was wrong. <laughs> really wrong. We actually see almost a perfect linear correlation uh, between the single spacecraft method uh, plotted on the y-axis versus the multi-spacecraft method plotted on the x-axis. So these are the uh, respective shock speeds uh, plotted here. And so this is actually a fantastic result, even though I was wrong, um, as it provides us with more confidence in our single spacecraft results when we have multi-spacecraft speeds to compare them to. Having one spacecraft such as wind does not suffice, uh, as shocks are these incredibly large scale structures that would need multiple points of the shock uh, detected to have more confidence in our shock characterization. Um, and as you can see though, there are some interesting error bars uh, present for some of the shock events, uh, which leads into the future work. Honestly, this is just the beginning of results and I'm um, going to be doing a lot more for this project such as looking into the trends regarding compression ratio, theta bn, as well as the shock type. As you guys might remember, uh, I stated earlier, those are kind of the key shock parameters um, that the analysis outputs. Um, we're also planning on calculating the propagation time that the shock would take to reach the Earth from wind, um, and possibly even the other spacecrafts. We're also looking to calculate uh, the angle that the shock makes with the Sun-Earth line, and in the midst of procuring these results, uh, we'll be working on a paper and hopefully presenting at AGU. Um, yeah, so honestly, none of this work would be, uh, it wouldn't have been possible if it weren't uh, for my family and my friends that I've made along the way. And of course, to all the mentors, especially Lucas, uh, Tatiana, and Mike, um, and of course the NSF for uh, their gracious uh, uh, I don't know if donation's the right word, but you guys, <laughs> <laughs> funding, funding. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I open uh, the floor to any questions that you guys might have. Thank you all for listening.
Thank you, Sophia. All right, who has questions? All right, back there. So you said that uh, like the results from multiple spacecraft versus one are reasonably well correlated. Do you expect that if the spacecrafts were separated much further that they would disagree more if the shockwave varies like spatially? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that is um, actually kind of a good point. So this uh, equation that I present, where is it? Ah. No, yes. So this equation you see here, I know that uh, the, we can still perform the calculation if um, the spacecrafts are in uh, kind of a position that are further away from each other. We would just be getting like much larger uncertainties okay. and that wouldn't really be like a result that would be useful. Gotcha. It, yeah. Cool, thank you. Totally. Yeah, I would guess that linearity would start to break down. Absolutely. Yeah, when you yeah. could start getting spacecraft farther apart. Kathy? Can you talk a little bit about what goes into calculating your error bars? I was kind of expecting to see a, a correlation between um, the number of spacecrafts and the, the error bars. So I was expecting the where the multi-spacecraft is on the horizontal axis, right? Mm -hmm. I was sort of expecting those error bars to be smaller, but I, just glancing at that plot, I don't quite think that's the case. So yeah. can you just talk about a little bit what goes into calculating those, those error bars? So, um, we obtain, so whenever we do the multi-spacecraft analysis, the numbers that we get back are the shock speed and the normal vector. And so those are kind of bootstrapped in a way. And so obviously the mean of the bootstrapping is the data point and then taking the standard deviation is where we get our error bars. And as to where those error bars come from is what I plan on look, so I'm continuing this project into the fall. And that will be kind of like my next step into seeing okay, hey, if we have like a more compressed shock, it results in maybe a higher error for the multi-spacecraft result. Or if we have a more oblique shock, maybe that contributes to um, these higher errors. But as of right now, I'm not really sure of any trends or um, current relationships between other shock um, characteristics, but um, definitely something I'll be looking to actually probably first week of school in two weeks. <laughs> any other questions? Somebody's got to have one, come on. <laughs> Chriselle has one. So I have a hypothetical question, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so in your multiple spacecraft, you had all the satellites in L1. What would happen if you had satellites in other L, like Grinch points? What do you think would happen or like what your analysis would look like? That is such a good question. So I'm not going to lie to you. I was... With the animation, ah, oh, where is it? Here it is. So the animation that I found here, this is actually from the European Space Agency's cluster mission, um, which is the ones they're operating are here and the ones we use are up here. Um, so I'm honestly not really sure what those would look like. I feel like observed at different points, they wouldn't be as useful to us just because being at L1, um, Having those shocks hit the spacecrafts then gives us um, a bit of time, probably like 30 minutes to like an hour and a half, depending on the strength and magnitude of the shock, to kind of like forewarn us about any possible shock wave hitting the Earth that could possibly cause issues. So I feel like if it was like where cluster is, that would be probably not enough time for us to, um, you know, uh, prepare or prep or be aware of or anything, and if they were at uh, different Lagrange points as here, um, I just feel like being at L1 gives us like the perfect means of observing these big shocks. Um, and I don't think the information at like L4, L5 would really be applicable to here on Earth. But I'm sure we could get some pretty interesting like information regarding the shocks, but I don't think um, like space weather implications, it wouldn't really tell us too much. But that's my opinion, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. All right, that's all the time we have for questions. So let's give another round of applause for Sophia. <laughs>
All right, so in our penultimate talk, we have Midge Hartshorn, who is joining us um, all the way over from Western Massachusetts, so Mount Holyoke College, and they are gonna talk about UV bursts and some of the opacity effects we see in those. So whenever you're ready, go for it, Midge. Is this, oh, there we go, okay. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, as Chad said, I'm Midge, and today I'll be talking about my work with uh, Dr. Chad Madsen, investigating capacity effects in UV bursts in the solar chromosphere. Um, for background on that, I'm going to kind of work backwards, uh, talking a little bit about the chromosphere, then about UV bursts, and then about opacity. Um, so the chromosphere is an intermediate layer of the solar atmosphere uh, between the solar surface and the corona. In the lower chromosphere, we see temperatures uh, close to the minimum solar temperature, around 4,000 Kelvin. Um, but as we move outwards towards the transition region and the corona, those temperatures can rise up to around 100,000 Kelvin. Uh, this is still much cooler than the corona, whose temperature is more on the order of a million Kelvin, as, as lots of people have mentioned <laughs> today. Um, UV bursts are, or, or ultraviolet bursts, um, they are these small, short-lived energetic events that are visible in the near and far ultraviolet. Uh, they occur in the active regions of the sun. Um, imaging data, as we see here, uh, shows UV bursts as these small, compact brightenings. Um, on the left, we have intensity, and so they're the, the kind of the brightest objects that you see in that um, uh, map on the left. On the right, we see that they are also accompanied by um, an, a broadening of the exponential line width. Um, and they're also accompanied by these areas of extreme redshift and extreme blue shift that are adjacent to each other, uh, which is suggestive of bidirectional flow and possible magnetic reconnection. Uh, but the really interesting stuff comes when we look at the spectroscopic data. Um, this is a spectral profile of silicon-4-1394 angstrom line. Um, and it's a little bit hard to see here, but at the bottom of this profile, uh, in the deep purple, that is a mean silicon-4-1394 profile from an observation um, where UV bursts occurred. And you can see it's a, it's a very shallow peak when we compare it to a UV burst um, as, as overplotted in the black. Um, the UV burst has this dramatic brightening, uh, this dramatic intensification and broadening. We see some splitting of the, of the profile, which can be, again, suggestive of bidirectional flow. Um, and the really interesting thing, the key thing about this and UV bursts is on the left there, we have that nickel two absorption feature. And that's really interesting because this is a silicon four emission line uh, that forms at temperatures around 80,000 Kelvin, so like transition region temperatures. Uh, but nickel-2 forms at a much cooler temperature, uh, close to the temperature minimum, around 4,000 Kelvin. And so what this tells us is that this UV burst is occurring in the chromosphere, but the presence of, of this strong silicon-4 emission suggests that we've got this amount of really hot plasma that's embedded really deep in the much cooler chromosphere. Um, and that's really, really weird. Um, and because of this, we suspect that UV bursts could teach us more about the transfer of mass and energy from the solar surface to the corona, which contributes to our understanding of um, the coronal heating problem, as well as our understanding of magnetic reconnection in partially ionized plasmas like we see in the chromosphere. Um, one tool that we have for studying UV bursts is electron density diagnostics. Um, these are relationships and tools that we uh, use to constrain our models of physical plasma characteristics, such as temperature and uh, other types of density. However, earlier work indicates that there may be problems with two of the most popular density diagnostics used to study UV bursts. Um, in this plot here, you'll see we have, um, we have electron densities from 
those two uh, electron density diagnostics, um, oxygen-4, oxygen-4 on the horizontal axis and silicon-4, oxygen-4 on the vertical axis. And these should be measuring the same physical property of the plasma. Um, but you'll note that instead of seeing some amount of agreement, uh, instead we have a total lack of correlation between the two uh, measures. And that's really concerning. Um, that indicates to us that one or both of these density diagnostics are flawed. And we'd like to know why and which, and if it's both. Uh, so we chose to investigate opacity of the silicon four lines as one potential cause. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about opacity um, or optical depth, which is how often on average a photon is absorbed or scattered outside the line of sight as it moves from its emission source to the observer. Uh, so optical depth is represented with the Greek letter tau as seen here. And broadly speaking, an optical depth of less than one means that most photons are escaping the source, um, they're reaching our point of observation, and we call that optically thin conditions. On the other hand, if that optical depth is less than one, uh, on average, each photon is being scattered or absorbed at least once on average. And so that means that a lot of our photons that are leaving the source aren't making it to us um, at the point we're observing them. And that means that it's hard to tell truly, like accurately what's going on with intensity because some of them just, they're, they're not hitting us. Um, and so we refer to that as being optically thick. And that led to our initial research question, which was, could the silicon four lines in UV bursts be becoming optically thick enough, often enough to explain those uh, issues with the UV burst diagnostics? Um, and in order to do that, we need some data. So UV bursts are observed with the Interface Region Imaging Spectrograph, IRIS, um, which is in space to avoid the influence of Earth's atmosphere. Um, and it has good coverage of the chromospheric passbands that we're interested in. IRIS provides uh, both split, slit spectroscopy and context images during its observations. So here I have um, a little animation of the silicon-4-1394 angstrom line as the slit passes over a UV burst. So you'll notice that there's, at one point, there's like a, right there, a dramatic brightening and broadening. Um, and the vertical axis here is just the position along the slit. Uh, this is in data from the context imager, and it's really hard to see, but there's a very fin faint vertical line that kind of moves across the whole active region here. That's the slit where we're getting our spectroscopic data. Um, and so in this case, we're choosing to have the slit raster across the field of view um, in a very dense uh, high resolution raster that allows us to sample as many potential burst pixels as possible. Um, and taking all this in mind, we decided to use data from three iris observations with good coverage of active regions uh, where these compact brightenings were noted. Um, that resulted in about 400,000 silicon-4 1394 line profiles for each observation. Um, but UV bursts are not occurring in most of those. So to filter through to find our potential bursts, I performed a four parameter single Gaussian fit to each profile, which allowed me to determine the line width and the peak intensity um, for each profile. And here I've plotted that information. We've got the line width in velocity units on the horizontal axis and uh, the intensity in calibrated spectral radiance um, along the vertical axis. And most of these uh, silicon four lines, they're just hanging out in this nice hat shaped region that you see in the, in the white uh, there. It looks a bit like a, like a hat with a broad brim. Um, and those are not UV bursts. We're interested in the, in the lines that are both unusually bright and unusually broad, which you'll see here as the bright green kind of spur or plume off the crown of the hat, as we like to call it. Um, so we're looking solely at that part, population. And that reduces our, our, um, our target population to about 1,500 lines per observation, which is much more, much more doable. Um, so at that point, um, I manually examined each profile looking for the presence of that nickel-2 absorption feature, which again is the thing that ties us to the chromosphere. Um, it's the thing that tells us, yes, we were looking at a UV burst, Yes, the silicon four is, is coming from that and not from something else. Um, and 
So here's an example again of what a UV burst looks like comparing wavelength and intensity. Again, plotted over the mean spectral profile for the whole um, observation. Um, to determine opacity, we then took um, the intensity of uh, the intensity ratio of silicon 4 1394 angstrom and its branching pair silicon 4 1403 angstroms, uh, which under normal conditions that intensity ratio is a nice even two. Um, but that ratio will start to break if we've gone optically thick and we're starting to see signs of self-absorption or resonance scattering. Um, so in order to do that, I literally lined up the centers of the two profiles and then divided them um, and examined the area around the central wavelength. And that's what this, this is what that looked like. Um, so on the bottom here, I have just the silicon four 1403 and 1394 angstrom line profiles um, for a given like area, uh, a given line. Um, and then on the upper, upper uh, plots there, I have the, that intensity ratio. So literally dividing the two profiles. Um, and it's a bit hard to see, but you can, if, you, if you follow two kind of across, that's where we would be looking um, to see. Uh, on the left here, we see that the, um, the white line is that ratio and the, the blue lines that kind of surround it are a three sigma uncertainty envelope. And so we see some noise kind of at the, particularly at the lower wavelengths. And then in the, in the left, this is still optically thin conditions. It's, it's still hovering right around two. But on the right here, this is an example of a pair that has gone optically thick. And what you'll notice there is we see a significant divot, a deviation from that ratio of two before kind of returning to more being around two. Um, and so we repeated this for all three observations. Um, and here I'm gonna plot them one by one. Uh, the horizontal axis here is spectral radiance or intensity and the vertical is the ratio itself. Uh, the dotted line shows the expected ratio, and it's important to note here that the, ex the ratio that's plotted here is not in and of itself indicative of whether or not that line is optically thick, because we're making that determination visually based on the context um, surrounding that whole divot shape. Um, there could be noise or other things that are moving the whole line profile above or below um, and altering that ratio. Um, and so the first 2013 observation, this is, this is what that distribution of ratios looked like. Uh, our second 2013 observation yielded pretty much the same kind of spread. But the really interesting thing happened when we got to our 2015 observation. Um, and you'll note here that all of a sudden we have many more line pairs with a ratio significantly below two. And this agreed, and, and like very few that are like above. Um, at least to the same extent as the other observations. And this agreed with my visual determination of the opacity of the lines within these observations. Um, in the first two observations, there was virtually no optically thick silicon four lines. Um, but that 2015 observation had many optically thick silicon four lines. And that answered our initial research question, uh, which was that the opacification of the silicon four lines does not appear to happen frequently enough to impact uh, the electron density diagnostics under UV burst conditions. Um, with our remaining time, we decided to delve a bit more into what made that 2015 observation so different from its counterparts. Uh, we noticed some uh, spectral morphological differences between the optically thick and optically thin lines. And for the next few slides, the optically thick lines will be noted in red and the optically thin lines in white. Um, so looking at the other iris pass bands, we noticed uh, continuum intensification and wing enhancement around magnesium H and K that could indicate photospheric stimulation. Uh, we noticed line splitting with that broad silicon 4 1394 line with the optically th thick lines blue shifted and the red shift suppressed. Um, and we also noticed potential opacification of the carbon one line uh, in the oxygen one 1356 pass band. Um, and so we formed a couple of hypotheses about why that 2015 observation was so different. Uh, we considered whether it had something to do with the global properties of the active region in which um, our 
uh, UV bursts were occurring, if it had something to do with the strength of the reconnection event, or if it had something to do with the orientation of the burst relative to our line of sight. Um, so we plotted up the, um, the locations of those optically thick and optically thin lines. Um, and this is where things got really interesting right at the end. Uh, these are spatial maps of representing the same area where um, the, if, if we look here, this is just plotting the area of the optically thick in blue and optically thin UV burst lines. Um, and you'll notice that most of the opacification is primarily located in the core of one burst. It's not throughout the entire active region. Um, it's not kind of more sporadic. And that corresponds with it being the most intense or bright object in that active region. And kind of the key thing here was that we were unable to resolve bidirectional flow for this UV burst. Uh, we only saw evidence of blue shifting and not the accompanying adjacent red shift. And that allowed us to make some conclusions here. We thought it was unlikely that um, the opacification was related to the uh, characteristics of the active region because we didn't see opacification in the other bursts. It's possible that it was related to the strength of the reconnection event given the intensity of that one burst compared to the others. Um, but we think it's probable that the orientation of the burst relative to line of sight um, and the resulting high column density that you know maybe we're looking through the outflow of the burst and the reconnection core and the material going inward um, could uh, contribute to that opacification. Um, our future our, our future work is to expand the data set into more observations, uh, possibly comparing to other data types of data. Um, and, but our initial conclusion was that the opacification does not occur frequently enough to account for our known problems. Um, I'd like to thank my mentor, Chad, um, as well as the rest of the people here at CFA, um, as well as my very patient son, who drew me this picture of the sun. And, <laughs> Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Mitch. So we have time probably for a couple of questions. Everything was clear? Oh, they're in the back, there we go. <laughs> Okay, so you determined that the opacity isn't really what's causing this problem you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any hypotheses on what your next best guess is for what might be causing those differences? Yeah, so um, it's a little bit, that's a great question. It's really hard to say, you know, with a sample size of three, um, but having such a stark difference between the uh, 2013 observations with no opacification and the 2015 with some was was a pretty good indicator that that was not quite the right uh, route. So we, we are hoping to um, expand to you know, other observatories, see if uh, maybe there's simultaneous opacification of other lines, um, because the oxygen-4 and sulfur-4 lines are also involved in, the, in um, other popular UV burst uh, electron density diagnostic pairs. Um, so maybe looking at those, um, but as of right now, it's still really unclear why those ratios are breaking down. Yeah, I suspect there's also some temperature effects and also some abundance issues because we don't really have a well-constrained understanding what the abundances look like uh, atomically in the chromosphere. So, so I'll add on to that. So we have a talk online. Um, says, great talk. Can you determine actual opacity values from your analyses? Ooh. Oh, that's a great question. I uh, don't know. Probably, but it would be very hard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, and I think you had your hand up before Callie, so. Um, I was wondering if, why is it so hard to observe the chromosphere directly compared to maybe something like the photosphere or the, the corona? Uh, great question. Uh, the photosphere is actually why it's really hard to observe the chromosphere uh, directly. Um, the continuum emission from the photosphere just completely overpowers and washes out um, the emission from the uh, chromosphere. 
except in you know these past bands that are you know we can't view on earth um and so it's it's just really hard to we have to um iris is a really well suited instrument for that in the fuv and nuv all right and kelly um i might have just missed this do you mind going back to the slide with the hat <laughs> Oh, yeah, that one. Um, so I know you said that you're specifically looking at the green dots mm -hmm. as UV burst candidates, but it looks almost like they're like slightly, like they're connected to the larger hat and then it just cuts off. So what are the parameters that define like what? Oh, are you talking about the, the hard line there? Mm -hmm. um, that is where we made the cuts in the data. Um, yeah. So there may be kind of, we can adjust those parameters slightly to, to cut the data in different places. Um, but again, most of the ones that are like very close to the crown of the hat are probably not actually UV bursts. Um, so, and we did filter through by eye that green data set to, um, to identify UV bursts visually. Um, All right, that's all the time we have for questions. So let's thank Midge again. All right. Uh -oh. <laughs> yep, it's happening. Yeah, just uh, try to clip on like the, the right lapel. So yeah, you can stick that part anywhere. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I think this one we verified it looked good. All right, so the final talk of the day is going to come from Andy Kasari. They are coming from the University of Chicago, and they're going to talk to us about quantifying the accuracy of coronal models over the solar cycle. So whenever you're ready, take it away. Um, hi, yeah, as Chad literally just said, I'm Andy. <laughs> and for the past 10 weeks, I've been working on quantifying the accuracy of uh, coronal models over the solar cycle uh, with uh, Sam Badman and Yami Rivera. Um, so first, to establish what a coronal model even is, um, a coronal model is basically just a model of the magnetic field within the corona of the sun because the, this magnetic field is what produces all the structure that we see in the corona. Um, and the particular model that we're, that we're using is called a potential field source surface model. And it's basically just a, a simplified model of the magnetic field in the corona. Um, it's, there's very little physics actually involved in the model. Um, you basically just take Maxwell's equations and you integrate it with an inner boundary condition being the magnetic field that we just measure at the surface of the sun, and then an outer boundary condition, um, which is set at the source surface radius. And at this radius, we say that the magnetic field is just pointed radially towards the sun or away from the sun. And that's meant to basically model um, the fact that we see that um, the solar wind is moving radially outwards from the sun, so it's supposed to mimic that, that um, effect that the sun has. Um, and why we're sort of interested in using, in, in evaluating a, uh, this simplified model compared to one that evol involves a lot of physics, like an MHD model, um, is because um, a PFSS model, one, the outputs of a PFSS model can be used in, as the inputs of more complicated models. And also, it's just computationally easier to do a PFSS model, um, so we want to know quantitatively, how much can we actually trust um, the results of a PFSS model? And so the way that we compare um, a PFSS model's results to actual, actual observations is we look at these two maps here. And so the top map is the um, magnetic field as the model predicts at the source surface. And then the, so red is 
uh, basically like positive polarity, so it's pointed away from the sun, and then blue is pointed inwards, and then white um, is no polarity. Um, and then the bottom map is showing the open field lines. So red is where there's a line that goes outwards towards the sun and the sun doesn't come back. And then blue is where it's going towards the sun. And then white is where there's a loop. Um, so one of the three observations that we want to compare this model to um, is the coronal holes that we see on the sun. Because we know that coronal holes occur where there are open field lines. And so we can directly compare that to where the model predicts that there should be open field lines. Um, yep. Oh, there we go. Another observable we look at is the white light data. So on the left, we see a nice, beautiful image of the uh, corona of the sun with the disk blocked by the coronagraph. Um, and from this, we can produce the map on the right, which is I could get into the details of exactly how this is produced, but it's basically just a density map of the plasma around the sun um, in those streamers. Um, and we know that these that helmet streamers occur where the, um, where the polarity would be neutral at the source surface. So we can compare where the streamers occur um, observationally with where the model says um, that the polarity is neutral. And then lastly, the third um, observable that we look at is the in situ polarity that we measure. Um, and the specific spacecraft that we use is wind. Um, and so on the left, um, that disk around the, the sun that's at the center um, is the orbit of wind projected onto the source surface. And red is when wind measured a, a positive polarity, and blue is when it measured a negative polarity. And so then, on the right, you can produce this plot of the polarity that measures over time. Um, and those lines are just, um, those lines that you see sort of pointing, uh, going towards the center, that's just those uh, field lines being um, traced back to, to the surface of the sun. And so from there, we have these three metrics that we can look at. Um, so one of them is the coronal hole metric, the white light metric, and the um, neutral line metric. Um, so the coronal hole metric on the top, that plot, the yellow is where the model um, and the observables um, agree with where the coronal holes should be, and the red is where they are discrepant. And so then we use those, uh, the basically just count up how many pixels those are, and we compare those two to find a single number that gives us, okay, this is how much the coronal holes agree. And then the bottom left, that yellow line is where we have traced where the streamers are. And then we can compare that to the black line where there's neutral polarity and see um, how much of those agree. And then on the bottom right, we have the orbit of wind projected onto the source surface. And so we can see where um, the uh, colors are the same, essentially, where the polarity is the same, and count those up and um, compare those to see how well it agrees in terms of the neutral line metric. And so now that we have all these, um, we've defined all these metrics, we can see how they change over time and with the solar cycle. Um, so during solar maximum, there's lots of sunspots in the sun because the sun is very active at that point. And we can see when there's a lot of sunspots, when it's solar maximum, each of the metrics is worse. Uh, particularly, you particularly see it in the coronal hole metric and the white light metric. And then when, um, during solar minimum, when there's not very many sunspots, um, the metrics are all a little bit better, um, which is cool, because that's what we kind of expected, that during solar maximum, when the physics in the sun is a little bit more complicated, that'll be harder to um, model what's going on in the corona. Um, it should be noted, though, that you see like in the white light metric, during solar maximum, it's just like nearly zero. Um, part of that is just because, I mean, you can actually see it in the previous uh, plot here on the bottom left. We've kind of done a bad job <laughs> tracing where the streamers are, like particularly during solar maximum. Um, if we actually just go back a little bit, oop, there we go. 
you can see there's not really just like a single line where the streamers are. It's a lot more complicated structure, but the way that our code is written, it just wants to find a single continuous uh, loop around the sun, but that's not really what's happening at solar maximum. And so that's why you see how terribly it matches there, and that's why you get really low scores during solar maximum. So that's something that we just have to improve in the future. Um, and here's just a cool little video <laughs> of the uh, coronal hole map changing over time. Uh, during, during solar maximum, there's a lot more coronal holes um, near the equator. And during uh, those times, um, well, you see a lot more like smaller sort of structures near the equator and then uh, bigger structures near the poles. And so it's harder for the model to hit those smaller structures and more like complicated structures near the equator. Um, and so that's why during those times it scores very low. But then during solar minimum, it's just these very two distinct large um, coronal holes in the two poles. And so it's very easy for the model to, um, uh, to capture that um, in the model. And then here's the um, white light metric over time. Um, you can see it like very clearly towards the end. Um, it immediately starts to like approach just a single line around um, the sun. And at that point, it's very easy for the model to capture that. Um, I can literally just like look at this for years probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's just very satisfying. And also this, I, you don't even notice this the first time watching it, but because this is over a, a full solar cycle, you actually see the polarity of the sun like switch. Um, so you see the pole switch, which I, I didn't even notice that the first time I watched this video. Um, but I just thought that was kind of cool. Um, and then a similar thing here, except we see the orbit projected onto, the orbit of wind projected onto um, this map. Um, and you can see it's honestly like pretty decent even during solar maximum. Um, but yeah. Oh, and the, the sort of wiggling that you see of the orbit up and down is just because the plane of um, wind, the plane of the orbit of wind is not in the same plane as the equator of the sun. Um, so as it moves, it's sort of moving up and down when you project that onto a 2D map. Um, so all of this involved a lot of coding. <laughs> and um, I love open source code. So we have everything on GitHub. And eventually, we want to like make a very usable Python package for the analysis of coronal models, um, because it makes results are very reproducible, and anyone can go on there and get the exact same results that we got, um, and even contribute to the code and improve it further. Um, and so just to wrap up um, everything I've talked about, um, over the 10 past 10 weeks, we've created a tool for evaluating coronal models, specifically PFSS models. We found that PFSS models, as we expected, are much better during solar minimum um, and much worse during solar maximum. And we also found that our way of um, comparing the white light data with our model needs a lot of improvement to actually capture how good the model is. Um, and that's one of the things we definitely need to work on in the future. In addition to that, it would be interesting to compare how good a PFSS model scores compared to a MHD model um, and see how much better it actually is and actually give a number to that. And then we would also want to properly release the Python package and make it more usable for other people um, rather than me being the only one who understands how any of it works. Um, and then, yes, acknowledgments. We have to recognize the people that gave us money, um, the wonderful NSF. Um, I love money. Money is good. Um, <laughs> I want to thank um, Sam and Yami for being very supportive and mentoring me through this entire process. I want to thank Tatiana for being the solar REU's mom. I think she's actually like described herself <laughs> as such. Um, I want to thank Chad for dealing with housing for weeks on end, um, sort of a never-ending cycle it seemed. Um, and then Kathy for organizing a lot of what goes went on in the solar REU. Um, so yeah, that's all I have.
Excellent. Thank you, Andy. So, questions? Midge. Very enthusiastic. Hi. Uh, great job. Thank you. Um, you probably said this right at the beginning, and I just totally blinked and missed it, but what does PFSS stand for? Oh, yeah. Potential Field Source Surface, as it stands for. Right. Kathy? Do you have any thoughts about uh, what would improve the coronal hole metric? Do you think you have to go to like a totally different magnetic field model, um, or could you do something like increase, you know, the resolution of the model or something? And would that help? Uh, wait, do you mean the white light metric, or do you mean the, the coronal hole? You were oh. saying that the you, it didn't pick up a lot of the smaller coronal holes that showed. Oh, up I mean that's equator. just. I mean that's kind of what we expect. I mean, that's just because the model isn't, like, like I said, it's a very simplified model. Um, you know, if you had like an MHG model, maybe it would be able to pick up more of that structure. But um, like sort of the, the entire point of the project was to see, oh yes, we, like we, we expect the model to be worse during solar maximum. So that's not really something that can be improved. That's just um, a feature of the model itself, I guess. And there are these um, magnetofrictional models. They're similar to uh, the model that, that Katie uses for the, the NLFF F, 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 F <laughs> modeling. How many Fs are there? Um, uh, but, but people have done those on like sort of full sun, people like Karen Meyer in, in the UK. Uh, and that might be sort of a, a, a like middle step between a PFSS model and a full-blown MHD. Mm -hmm. Model, you could try using some one of these like magnetic frictional mm -hmm. models. Um, they have, they have the filaments in there, and so you get a, a little bit more realistic magnetic mm -hmm. field. Any more questions? Nick, um, what was the name of your Python package, and why did you pick the name? Oh, that? <laughs> that's a funny question. Um, <laughs> why'd you make a face at me like that, Sophia? Anyways, um, yeah, so that's the name of it. Um, I kind of obsessed for a little too long about what to name it, but eventually settled on this because it's nice and short and sweet and kind of captures it. Um, yeah, because it is coronal magnetic fields, so maybe it should be coronal magnetic fields, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I want to put evaluation in there. Yeah, but it's just too, okay. The original name was Coronal Model Eval, which doesn't have the same ring to it as no. CMF Pi. So. <laughs> Com that's actually good. That's yeah. so good. That's pretty that's solid. That's so good. Wait, maybe it should be Comfy Pie now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's like so amazing. There's wow. one thing you take out of this symposium. Because <laughs> it even a good works, acronym is everything. As it even works, <laughs> so you can take the O from Corona. That's so good. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <now>. <laughs> Any other questions, Griselle? So great job. Um, what kind of observations would you use to compare your model to like observations? Like if you were to take an instrument, what instrument would you use to compare your kernel hole results? Oh, um, that's actually, so if we go back here, here we go. Okay. So yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we just find like, we have a algorithm that finds where there are large dark regions and so that those are the uh, coronal holes. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Let's give a round of applause for Andy. All right, so that concludes the symposium. So every year, it's always amazing to see what our students can do over the span of just 10 weeks. So it's amazing. Everything that you guys have done is phenomenal. So to do this in 10 weeks 
So to do this in 10 years is hard. <laughs> to do this in 10 weeks is a lot harder. And to go into it more or less blind about what the subject matter is, is incredibly amazing. So every one of you has the talent, the drive, the passion, so, and the willingness to do this, and you, every one of you deserves a round of applause again, so. So, it's been an honor watching all of you grow, and we, and to conclude, uh, rather kind of jarring transition, but there is a group photo at 3.30 in the courtyard. Yes. So, yes, Kelly. Um, the RU students would also like to extend our thanks to the RU coordinators and to the mentors and everyone in SSXG for their guidance and patience. And on that note, we actually have a gift from the Solar RU oh. students to all of SSXG. Oh. <laughs> No problem, we'll wait. <laughs> so. well, while we're waiting, we could announce the Astro RU talks are tomorrow. Yes, Astro RU talks are tomorrow. I believe it's 9 to 4, so they have a few more students. So um, definitely you should, uh, so your RU is de facto over, but I think you, you could should so, show a lot of support and show up for the Astro RU. I know some Astro students definitely showed up here. So yeah, definitely show your support for them. So they've been through another brutal 10 weeks just like you. So. And Latino Initiative have a poster session tomorrow at noon. Yes. Outside with pizza. <laughs> so. Oh my goodness. At one of the SSXG meetings, Kathy mentioned that it would be cute if there was more decor in the <sighs> lower hallway. And you mentioned decorations for the solarium, and we thought it'd be cute if we took charge and did that ourselves. So yeah, if people could help. That would be great. <laughs> so we made you a sign. Yay. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> oh, and the emphasis on the O. Oh, we signed the sign. Oh, and everybody signed it. Oh. That is awesome. Guys, that's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. So who did the woodworking? So <laughs> nice, that's awesome. Does that have a spot in mind for it? Well, we figured that was kind of a you guys thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we really to up. But it does have little like hanger things on the back. Perfect. <laughs> That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you, guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but somebody might want to help actually put it down somewhere. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, that works. All right. Oh, and we also all have to go to your office to get a poster. Oh, yeah, do it.